What's today's session about? Today is about um, not providing any additional level of media coverage around the world around us. We get enough of that as it is. Uh, we know that we're in an environment where change is uh, pretty much consistent at the moment. Um, we're in a fairly anxious time. I think in terms of uh, the 14 months we've been through have been almost we had to do things. We had to kind of deal with things. We had to fix things. Now we're getting to a point where there is a little bit of an opening up and we're beginning to have to make some choices about things. Uh, choices about how we choose to engage with these changes going on, but also begin to start to recognize that what we valued and gained out of the last 14 months of increased self-awareness and reflection doesn't go to waste. That we've maybe found a better balance in our life. Maybe uh, there are some things we've become more aware of. So there's an interesting time we're in, and it's very easy for us to become fairly media-centric on the whole thing. But I'd like to just really leave you with a few things that I think you can take away in a practical way to help yourself and help your teams as they begin to kind of make some sense and navigate in this space. I think firstly, what I would do is suggest to you that we're in a, in a time where um, it's kind of an odd one. It's rather perverse to say this, but when we're in a position of crisis, it's often when the best of ourselves shows up. It's when our best thinking comes forward. It's when our best um, contributions come into play because we are being emotionally engaged in something. We're being emotionally driven to focus on something. And if nothing else over the last year that we should realize is that um, people are in a position of productive disruption. They're considering what's going on. They've been made aware of the uh, significance of, of this global situation we're in. So there's a sense of engagement emotionally in what's going on. And I would encourage you as a leader to look at that in a really positive way or a manager. You've got a very activated group of individuals, which we should begin to not abuse, but we should utilize. Have conversations that we would have otherwise avoided uh, try out some experiments which we would have otherwise put off because now's the time when you're going to get more kind of involvement and engagement than you will have ever done um, probably previously. So crises are an interesting thing for us and we should never miss on the opportunity. The second thing I would say is that um, there's a number of things that have happened and I'm not going to give you an endless list and read these all out one to one but um, people have kind of had a chance to really where we thought previously we there's no way we can do that that's not going to work um we've actually begun to realize we can do some extraordinary stuff time 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 frames and time scales have reduced dramatically in all kinds of different roles i think we've ended up being much more kind of open about our own personal situations than we might have previously done because of the nature of working from home if we've done some of that We've, we've opened up our houses and our homes to people to see on webcams. I think your awareness as a leader is probably heightened. I think your awareness of everyone has been heightened. I think we've begun to realize that we're part of a global pandemic, which we've perhaps been part of, and we're beginning to reflect on our role as a global citizen. And what's our role in making sure that we work for a business that's ethical and environmental and considerate? And we're pretty aligned. There's a commonality to this issue. It's not just localized to one area or one organization. So I, again, not wishing to over dramatize, but there's some interesting criteria that where we may feel we're going through some change and, a, and more change, this has got some kind of criteria to it that we shouldn't really miss on. So to give you a suggestion of the kind of input I'd like to share with you, I'm going to just just very, very briefly give you two bits slides, two bits of information around Franklin Covey, because that does inform the thinking that we're going to share with you. The first is, is that we are an organization that has a privilege of being global, which is very uh, nice, and it's 160 odd countries we work in, but we do believe in enabling greatness in people. And that, that again is going to be shared in our thinking in a minute, but enabling greatness makes the point that we believe that you and I and everyone else that you work with already has the aspiration to be great. Your team members already want to be great. They might not use those words, but they do want to be the best they can be. So it may not always be that we have to motivate them or inspire them. Maybe it's about making it easier for them to bring their greatness and best they can to work every day. Maybe business gets too complicated. Maybe it's trying to make sure they can 
walk the path that we've designed for them rather than putting things that trip them up every two minutes. And the second thing that we do as an organization, and it'll come up in front of you, is the fact that we are a business that focuses on your results, your performance improvement, of course. But it is through sustained behavior change. And unfortunately, as human beings, we're pretty poor at changing our behavior. So it's not an easy gig. You know, we spent our life trying to build stability and habit and efficiency and order. And then change comes along and disrupts all that. So there's a, it's illogical for us to constantly be absorbing change because it goes against the Darwinistic survival piece. But what it does mean is that we need to recognize that for all of us, we are at this very moment in time, players inside an organization. We can't deny that. We're not here with an open savanna in front of us. We, we, we're sitting inside an organization that's hired us to do a job. And they've designed that organization in a certain way. And I'm not here to teach you about systemic thinking, but we all sit inside something and we're sitting inside an organization that's got clients and it's got a vision and a mission and a strategy and systems and processes and, and whatever else. But the reason I share this is because the purpose of this little short talk today is to remind you that you as an individual, as a manager or as a leader or as an individual contributor, possess choice. You can choose how much or how little to give to your organization depending on how your needs are met. Your team members choose how much or how little to give to the organization depending on how their needs are met by yourselves, if you're their manager or leader, how excited they feel about what they're doing. And that's a human being kind of muscle that you'll never take from people. You can't take choice from people. So when we look at the sort of suggestions today, it's to leave you with something that is about engaging people. It's not about directing people. And in fact, in some ways, <clears throat> we need to realize that we're in a world where I think uh, not only has that system been, un, uh, been relaxed slightly because we've had to break kind of some of the models that were, were business practice before. You know, we didn't have the beauty of going through all the processes. We've got to get this out to the market right now. We've got to be really quick and really agile and responsive. We've got to be faster to the marketplace than we've ever been. We've got to be creative. We've got to drop some of these formalities and bureaucracies. So it's unfrozen quite a lot of what the organization has, has perhaps historically um, held itself back in some ways. But what we do know is that as individuals and as leaders and managers, we're all going through some form of change. So we mentioned it in the title, Managing Change. What is this all about? Now, this is a change model you've probably seen many, many times. If you haven't, let me take you through it really, really quickly. But there's a few things I'd like to pick up on. That when we travel from a position of status quo on the left, this is what was previous life pre-pandemic. We were thrown into disruption with the door slamming shut very quickly because the world suddenly got hit by a pandemic. We didn't volunteer it, we didn't choose it, we got thrown into it. Now, the idea of the model is that we go through that disruption to a point where we eventually begin to make a point of decision and start adopting new ideas, zone of adoption, which ultimately leads to this innovation, which is the benefits of change. Now, it looks all nice and smooth, doesn't it? It's a very easy journey. It never works like that in reality, but there's a couple of things I think that are important for you to think about as a manager or a leader of a team of people. The first is, is that when you hit this position, when you've gone through some disruption, and it's probably where we're sitting now, we're beginning to look at the new normal. We're looking at the hybrid teams. We're looking at the way forward. There is a large edge that sits at that kind of line in the middle there where some people find very anxious to cross. The edge is not a comfortable space. They get stuck because what's beyond it is slightly scary. It's slightly new. It's unpredictable. It's not tested. So what happens is, is when we find people get stuck, there's a tendency in a leadership and management space to go back into the slightly more industrial approach, which is let's put stronger controls in. Let's force people to cross. Let's put more measures in, more uh, incentives to motivate people. So it's externally trying to drive people across the edge. And you may well find some people react to that. I would encourage you, though, to think about this as an alternative. And the alternative is very much in support of the structure I'd like to leave you with, or the framework. 
your job is really to be able to make sure that as they cross that edge into a new space, that you clear that path and trust people. It sounds like it's a radical idea. It's not. You know this. But it is a, it's about clearing the path, make it easy for people to be able to experiment, try new ideas out, to pick up on something different, and trust people. I mean, really trust people. So I'm going to pick up on that in terms of how we do that in a minute and leave you with a framework to go ahead. I just want to do one more thing, and then I will pause and check up on if there's anything that you're sharing. Because I'd like to encourage you as you go through this, um, anything at all um, that's an observation, an insight, an experience, a commentary, put them into the chat or put them into the questions part, poll. In terms of, so Robin can have a look at that and we can see if there's anything that we can then respond to and give some additional language or conversation around. So anything at all that's catching your attention or you're reflecting on, feel free to be able to kind of store that into the questions section. And we can see if we can do our best to respond to it. What we might do is pick up with some of them offline afterwards if necessary. Uh, I should also say that you are going to be asked, you'll be sent a workbook, a short, small little workbook, which will support some of the core information in this uh, PowerPoint deck as you go along as well. So you're going to be get that in your inbox afterwards. So just before we pause, if there's any questions that are coming to mind or insights or opinions around this, um, <clears throat> there is a piece that I think is worth just thinking about before we get stuck into the change. Uh, we are great believers around the idea and the concept of a mindset needs to precede a skill set. In other words, before we start doing something different, are we seeing the situation differently? Are we seeing our role differently? Are we seeing the needs of our team and our customers and our clients differently? Because the landscape is different nowadays. Whether we like it or not, there is a different landscape. And I know it's a bit of a hype to say that. But the landscape is different. And if we keep trying to cross that landscape with the old maps that we had 14 months ago, those maps might not be relevant. We've got to change how we see the landscape before we start crossing it in an effective way. And the principle behind that is really it's really quite solid and it's quite common sense for us. You and I and everyone else is constantly looking at the world in front of us and trying to make sense of it. We're looking through a lens that we've spent our life building some strength around. So when we look at the world in front of us, we look at our behaviors of the team. We look at the way the world's reacting to things. We're trying to make sense of that. Because if we can make sense of something, we can then navigate through it. If we can't, we tend to turn around and walk away from it because it's slightly scary. So we have to build some sense of security for ourselves, inside ourselves, to feel comfortable to, to, to cross the line, if you like, to move into something different. It doesn't happen accidentally. And I do think there are a couple of things for us to bear in mind is that we've got to recognize that we are not going to be able to answer every question that we might want nowadays. That security we try and find in our lives, there's a lot of work, the world out there right now that none of us have the answer to. Or some people might have had an experience in that area, but others haven't. Or leaders are going to be increasingly, and managers are going to be asked to lead teams into work that they've never done themselves because the world's moved on at pace. And it would be nice to think I came through that and I worked it, you know, rolled my sleeves up, did that job for many years, and then I got promoted. Sometimes you're in the role of a manager leader where you've got no experience of what the team are doing. You still got to lead them though. So we've got to utilize the the diversity, the input, the creativity, the contribution of people around us in a very, very, very different way than we used to. Otherwise, we just won't survive. So how does that work? Well, there's two mindsets I'd like to share with you. Uh, the first is around fear, and it's quite a dramatic word to use, but a fear mindset, which is where we tend to be very dependent on waiting to see what others do. Let's wait, you know, I don't want to go first. Let's wait and see when someone goes first, I'll follow from what they do and see how well that lands. And if they get burnt, I'll definitely not do it. 
that's the fear mindset against a more courageous mindset which recognizes the only way i can get courage is by working with other people not as an island doing it by yourself is a lonely business so how do i work with other people to find ways to navigate forward is going to develop that courage for me and i'm not going to build this slide up i'm just going to show them in, in, in a kind of whole block but if you look at the fear mindset I'm sure you're having a scan down those as you look at them, but these are some that, I mean, all of us will have some element of this, but these are mindsets that are stalling your ability to lead. You're stalling your ability to create momentum for the team, stalling your ability to move and progress in the midst of change. Because we're waiting for example, you know, we're waiting for guarantees. There aren't gonna be guarantees. I think that's, that's the nature of change. You can't often guarantee when you move into the zone of adoption. We make excuses for ourselves. You know, if I don't start it, then I can't fail. Well, that makes sense, I suppose. But it does mean you're not moving at all. The fear of being judged by people external to ourselves. Again, that fear is, is quite normal for us, but we've got to get past it as a leader to kind of think a little bit more interdependently. These are people that realize that I don't have the answer. And the only way I'm going to have the answer is by learning from others, listening to people, really listening with the intent to understand, listening with the intent to be influenced, listening with the intent to learn. And that actually the differences in your viewpoint and mine is, is the secret source that's gonna help us to, to move through this. I agree that in my head and every morning I'm gonna get up for work, and realize I'm never, ever, ever going to have full information to do something. I'm always going to probably have to progress on incomplete information. In other words, don't seek perfection. There isn't such a thing. You, your aim is momentum. So there's a lot on the left and the right that you can probably recognize in yourself and your team, but your, your aim is to try to move more increasingly to the right hand side because i think that's the way you're going to survive in a world that we're in today we do not diminish our role but our role is no longer the expert our role is to engage and facilitate the conversation and the engagement of our team to bring the best of themselves in a diverse way to be able to find solutions that none of us probably have in our own heads by ourselves but together we could do something about it so a couple of things for you to think about on a personal level, just a couple of things, and then share with you the framework that I'd like you to think about for a team. But before we do that, I'm just gonna pause just to check in. There might not be, but if you have, uh, Robin, anything that you're picking up in the questions at all that just we need to pick up with or check in with? Yeah, we do actually have one question, which is, which I think a lot of people will benefit from. And um, what can we do to equip our leaders to lead hybrid teams as you move into the new normal? Um, I think there's a few things that I would suggest. I think that the first is that they've uh, leaders have got to really adjust their viewpoint around their levels of trust in their team. I think they've got to, I mentioned it at the beginning, I think the default behavior for any leader leading a team in a hybrid environment is one, you've got to really uh, by default extend trust to the team. And what I mean by that is I'm going to implicitly trust that they're going to try to do the right thing until they get proved otherwise, but I will still extend my trust in other words i extend my trust if someone supports that then we get benefits from it if they abuse that i still extend trust but i deal with that abuse separately the minute you break i'm trusting you as a team in the hybrid environment uh, and you go back to an old way of working then you will almost never have the opportunity again to do that so the first is i think extend trust and the second is to engage the team in the design of that hybrid. You want a team culture that sits independently from work. You want a team that's bought into some way of working that every single person, whether I'm sitting on the beach in Bermuda, which would be nice, sitting at home, sitting at Starbucks, sitting in the office, wherever I'm working my hybrid working, I know that my team and all of us are working to the same template. So I think there's a couple of things. Team leaders extend trust. And secondly, through a framework, we can talk about as offline, maybe as a structure, but how do you take teams through a set of conversations 
to begin to make sure that that design of that work culture is agreed and contractually agreed almost between us. But it may well be, Robin, it'd be an interesting one when we go through the framework at the end, that that might be an additional support for how you go about doing that as well. So let's revisit that at the end as well and see if we've answered that question a bit more. Okay, has it answered that question, please? Okay. So um, just to continue then to kind of uh, go into a little bit around myself. So managing change, leading with courage, my intent. Um, <clears throat> I put that in there, my intent, because I would love you to consider the fact that as a leader, you do not have all the answers. All you often have is an intention. What I'm trying to do is this. What my hope is this. What the direction is I'm taking this conversation is this. I'm trying to kind of focus on moving ourselves forward. My intent as a leader is a little bit like the indicators on the outside of a car. I'm trying to communicate to my team what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to turn right, trying to turn left. It's not for your benefit. You're in the car. You know you're turning right or left. That's not the point. It's to help the team to know where you're going. So often as a leader, don't beat yourself up if you don't have all the answers. Your intention is the most powerful part of what you've got. Where does that come from? Well, really what it comes from is the idea that we need to develop the courage to be able to just lead unconditionally, lead when I don't have full information. And there's a few things that will help you do that. The first is leadership is much more about connecting to who I am. Why do I want to be a leader? Why is this important to me? It's not a job description, this. it's actually a choice. Management is a, is a role. Leadership is a choice. Because if you decide who I am, what I stand for, what my values are, what's important to me, then you can start saying, okay, that's going to influence how I choose to think in the way I see things, the way I make decisions. My guidance system is going to be influenced on who I am and the contribution I want to make, which leads me to then obviously logically influence the actions I take, which ultimately will influence the results I get. Now, again, as a leader, it sounds quite heavy, this, but just to stop and say, if I'm in a position of managing or leading a team, why am I choosing to do that? If I don't want to do it, then don't do it. But if I want to do it, why? What does it mean to me? How do I want to think about my role, my responsibility, my contribution? What actions do I take? And therefore, the results I achieve. And there's a sequence in that. It starts at a very kind of roots level. The stronger my foundation of who I am and how I think is going to strengthen my actions I take and the results I achieve. In other words, what I see leads to how I behave, which leads to the results I get. But how I get that courage isn't just going to be based on me doing it by myself. What you are also going to think about is how you are engaged with the organization you work for. You're going to do the same with your team members because at the lowest possible level of choice, you're gonna have some people that might be rebelling or quitting against what's going on around us. They're fighting the change. They're fighting what's going on. They're probably on the way to the door already, in which case we don't have to worry about it. You may have some people at a level of what we call obedience. They're doing it if they have to. They're really fighting you at every corner. They're quite kind of grumpy about the whole thing. They're hard work for you as a manager and as a leader. Now, if you've got people in these two positions, the trouble is you have to address it because if you think you're the only one that knows that, everyone knows it. Everyone knows who are the people in the team that are at this level. And if you don't act on it, it weakens your leadership. So you have to address this. It's an important part of your role as being a manager and a leader. We then get two groups of people in the middle who are good contributors to the job. They're compliant, they're cooperative, they're good people, they do what they're asked to do, they show up in the morning, they leave in the evening, they do what they're being asked, but that's all they do. They, it is a job. And they are in some ways, not it's not a judgment on them personally, but they're passengers in your team, they're passengers in your business. You need to take them everywhere. They won't take themselves because it's just a job. Now, your choice as to whether that's an acceptable level of percentage in your team or not, it's up to you. But if you're trying to get people to really, in a hybrid environment, be more autonomous, make decisions independently, and have the bravery to bring their best to work every day, 
you're not going to probably get that from cooperative and compliant people because it's just a job. Why should I go the extra mile? Whereas if we get commitments, then we're getting people now starting to lean into this. They see a career in the background. They see growth. They see opportunity. So they're going to be stronger in the way that they show up through to the fact that I think ideally, if we can get people to a point of excitement, then you're going to get a level of independent kind of courage. People do the right thing because it's just the right thing to do. It's more about a purpose to them rather than a job. And so I just show you this to think about when we're trying to push a rock up the hill, it's probably because they're not someone that's engaged in the organization the right way. We're trying to force them to be a high trust employee working in a hybrid environment when they're just not that excited about the job. And so maybe we need to come back from that and work on how do we get them engaged in the job or maybe they're in the wrong business. And that's not being cruel to people, that's being good to people. But don't forget that wherever they're at, if you're trying to move people, move a team, move, uh, move towards change, you don't have the predictive answer. You just have your intent. And your intent, if they understand that, counts so much more than technique. Don't expect to be perfect at being a leader, perfect at being a manager. If I'm led by someone who makes mistakes, but I trust what they're trying to do, I'll forgive them. I'll work with them. I'll support them if I understand their intent. If I don't, then I'll just judge your behavior. I'll judge the um, inefficiency of what you're doing. So it's a very powerful asset for you as, a, as, a, as an individual to have. And I, Sorry, just skip slides. Um, but what it is about is making sure that we are really clear that intent is something that is based on a very powerful motivation. I'm doing this because I want to help but I just don't know what the answer is and they need you to join me on this. And if you do follow people, and I'm not an advocate necessarily for Elon Musk, but I do quite like what he's creating and disturb, that he disturbs businesses, he disturbs organizations, is that he says, I remember if you follow him, he's, you know, SpaceX is his new venture trying to get us to Mars. Um, now, when he's asked, you know, how are you gonna get to Mars? Well, he says, you know, we're going to get there by 2024, but I have no idea how we're going to get there. And he's a classic of communicating his intent. And what his, his business thinking is, is that if I go as far as I can with the technology we've got, and we keep moving forward with an intent to get to Mars by 2024, people will join us on the journey. But do I know I'm going to get there? I have no idea. We're just going to have to wait and see. And he is significantly disrupting business because he's coming in with that mindset in whatever he does, Tesla cars, PayPal, SpaceX, and whatever else he's doing uh, after this. So he's an interesting model for us. So the first thing I would suggest to you as an individual is just check in with yourself, also check in with the individuals in your team. Where are they at in terms of their level of engagement? If they're not at a, at a commitment level, minimum, hopefully excitement level, then you're gonna have a lot of hard work to get them to engage in anything beyond change. Where we've come from a status quo, going through change into something different, they're gonna fight you on that. They're gonna find it very difficult because they're just not that excited about what we're doing. So you're gonna have a lot of work on your plate. But the main thing I want to leave you with is really this piece. And we'll just take the next kind of 10, 15 minutes to go through this. But really, a few thoughts and ideas. But before we do that, I just want to, again, just make sure. Robin, anything coming in on the individual piece? Or are we okay to keep going? Um, we do have something that's coming. Um, I think it's more goes back to the, uh, the previous session, to be honest with you, Tim. Um, how do we foster trust when there are piece examples of errors um, or lack of attention to detail. Um, the go-to is then to uh, check everything, which is not a good environment for either party. Yeah, um, big question. Um, I think the first thing is, as an individual leader, you've got to be robust. And um, if you believe that the culture that you're trying to move to is to have a better engaged, um, slightly more autonomous, if you like, 
team. In other words, they're making more decisions themselves around the level of detail. They're not they're looking at their own development to become better at what they do. They're not waiting for you to tell them. Then I think you have to stay hold steady on on your your extension of trust, which I've raised already. What I would say though is the second thing is always is that it's so easy to see behaviors that don't fit and just react to the behaviors. I would sounds like me being very preachy, but I would suggest just be very cautious not to react to people's behaviors, particularly at the moment. People's behaviors are a little bit disconnected or disjointed. They're a bit they're driven by some levels of anxiety and worry that we probably haven't seen before. So my curio my suggestion to you is be curious. If someone's not performing to the level of standard or you're not feeling they're taking on board the level of trust you're giving them, try not to judge the behavior, but get underneath in terms of, so what could be causing that? Why is it they might not be paying the attention that they should be on the work that they're doing? Is it a skill issue? Is it an attitude issue? Is there something else going on? So be curious about something beyond or behind the behavior, because I, I do believe most people are trying to do the right thing, and most people's behavior shouldn't be a surprise to us either, in that it's created by something. And that's really the job of, I think, managers and leaders right now, is that the, the behaviors are often ones that we could get ourselves into a dangerous position if we react to, rather than taking the time to be curious and understand. And that's a very simplified answer to your question, but it's a great one to learn that kind of reactive versus proactive response to things. We've got to be more proactive, get curious, find out why. People don't choose to show up as bad people. They are often just led that way through something. What is it? Don't know. Let's try and find out. Thanks for that, Robin. So just keep the questions coming in. We've got probably one more pause point at the end of the next section. So if there's anything else you want to add in, please do pop them into the questions section. So leaving you then with this piece. So we're talking about the mindset. We talked about our individual kind of thinking around our role. This final piece is then a very much more framework based um, piece to leave you with around how do we then intentionally engage our team as they travel through some change. And that the process of this again and again, the same as we said earlier on, is don't assume that you've got control over your team. The team gives you the control. They give you the authority depending on how they feel about you. You maybe naively think because I'm, I'm the boss that I have control. You don't. You don't. They have authority. They give that to you depending on how they feel about the situation, how they feel about you. So that, that's always sitting in the background. What you do need to realize is that right now, if I was to say anything that when you're managing people through change, there's something that is in play that we need to recognize. And what this is really about is that there is a very strong human DNA in all of us, which is that in whatever we do, as I said earlier on when we referenced the pair of glasses, we're always looking to find some sense of security in whatever we do. So there's a deep, 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 deep need inside all of us is to have some sense of control in whatever it is we do. Either I've got it, or I have a sense of control that the boss has got it, or that we as a team have got it. But either way, to be feeling I'm in an environment that is safe, then I'm gonna survive in it classic caveman kind of stage. It's that sense of, you know, we're gonna fight tooth and nail if we're feeling threatened or run. But there's an interesting spin on this. Right now, I think that your team are gonna need one of these rather than the other. So in other words, what they need right now is they need to know and they need to be reassured that you are in control. Now, in control is about the what. I'm, I'm in control of what it is that we're facing. I'm confronting the reality of the situation. I'm looking at the challenge in front of me and grabbing it. I'm not afraid to be in control of taking uh, on board what's really happening around us. Now, in control gives guardrails for people. It gives perimeter fences. It gives white lines around the playing field. It gives the wooden boards around the sand pit. 
whatever metaphor you want to use, it gives boundaries to where I now ask you to go and operate. So if I want you to cross into a new area of work, I better give you some pretty tight boundaries to work within because otherwise you're going to feel threatened, you're going to feel exposed, you're going to feel vulnerable, in which case I can guarantee you will not cross into it. I wouldn't. People often say, you know, if you just let people go and be creative, they'll be kind of disruptive. I've never, ever, ever seen that in my business career. When you open up, you know, people's creativity, they don't go wild. If they don't know what it is you want to do with my creativity, they actually do the opposite. They freeze. Because they're not sure what you want me to do or where you want me to play or what you want me to focus on. So being in control is critical at this very moment in time because there are people who are very anxious about this change, this hybrid, this moving into a new normal. What happens post-pandemic? People need to have some reassurance. But what you don't want to do is to be controlling. So being in control means I, I set the parameters of what I'd like you to focus on. I stand on the side of the playing field and I'm kind of coaching you in that respect. Being controlling means I've not only told you what I want you to do, but I'm going to tell you how to do it as well. I'm probably even going to get on the playing field and do it for you. The minute you do that, you kill trust. Because the team are then saying, well, why would I bother? You know, you seem to get on the field anyway and do it for me. So I'll just wait for you to kind of get the job done and I'll go and have a nice relaxing time. And as we talk about being controlling, is a really good indicator to you that you've lost your leadership. Leadership isn't doing the work. Leadership is about stepping back and letting others do it. And so when you look at the role you're playing in an environment that needs some controls, there are some basics for you to think about. When you take on the role of a leader, a couple of things for you to consider. What's different from being an individual contributor? And how do I need to see it differently? So the first is, in terms of the results you achieve as a leader or a manager, an accidental manager often. The difference here in terms of the results that you achieve is it's no longer about you. It's no longer about your individual effort. It's about the team effort. It's about getting results through other people. And that's a really big shift for people that, that excelled about being an individual contributor. So the first is recognize the results aren't about you, it's about your team. The second is to recognize that there are certain key things that you need to do as a leader to build the team's capability to do that. And we've let, listed this as six things, which I'm going to go through in a bit more detail in a second. You need to reflect on your mindset. You need to build the one-to-one -one relationships. You need to set your team up for, for the results. You need to keep them focused. You need to know what it is that is important to us. We need to have a very, very open culture of feedback. If we don't have that, it's a lonely business being a manager and a leader. We need to lead through change intentionally. Don't treat this as an accident and don't ignore it. The reality is change is a consistency in our life. And we need to look after people. Look after their well-being, look after their health. It isn't about you know, um, waiting till we need to kind of call an ambulance. This is, we, we are predictive. We know what happens if we don't invest in ourselves. We need to make sure that the leader, if it's you, you've adjusted how you're thinking about the situation. Yeah, I'm constantly working with my team. I'm not directing them. I'm not leading them necessarily by myself. How do we work together to find solutions to deliver the results? We've got to get smarter about how we deliver results. There are no more hours in the day. So we've got to be smarter about how we do this, and that's up to us to think about. And then finally, we need to personally look in the mirror and really think about my connection to a set of guiding values and principles. I need to think about my consistency, my authenticity, my congruency to make sure I build that trustworthiness with the team. So we need to make sure that we realize that our role is different and there are some additional things that are making it tougher. We've got to do things that we probably haven't done before. We've got to be a player and a coach. We've got to be able to lead people in work that we might never have done before. 
we've got to be really quick on and nimble on the changes going on around us. These are happening at speed now. We've got to deal with the remote nature of teams, which was something we hadn't anticipated, but it's in, it's now on our doorstep. So we've got to deal with that. And, and I think, you know, we're just having to absorb the fact that our role is right at the front line often. So we are the people that have a huge influence on the results the organization delivers. And we should never diminish the importance of that. So I'm going to take you through just in those kind of ideas we just shared, the six kind of what we call six practices that I'd like to leave you with that I think are a really good kind of framework or template that I think you should consider thinking about developing your capability around. Build a toolkit around this. Uh, first is reflect on your mindset as a leader. Have I seen myself differently? Do I need to see myself differently? I'll go through that in a second. We need to build the one-to-one -one relationships. We need to make sure we focus on the getting results piece. We know that that's important. We know that that's a, a critical part. There's a certain amount of hours in the day. Let's focus on it. Let's get people doing the right thing. Let's make sure we build feedback. Let's make sure we consciously and deliberately help people through change. That's going to happen. It's going to consistently show up. There's no change, no difference here. It's nothing new. And then the last is make sure that we look after people's health and well-being. So we know these are the six practices that I think we need to focus on as a leader. They're not, you know, they're not complex, but they are deliberate. They're a discipline. And the first part of this is, as I said, developing a leader's mindset. Very simple objective in this. The idea is to make sure that we don't just go from an individual contributor into becoming a leader without resetting how we see our role. I have to recognize that I've got a different responsibility now. So the first is to make sure we do due care on that. And the second practice, as we said, is the idea of one-to-one -one relationships. And really what we're saying here is this is about that your role is based on your credibility with individuals. And this is the fact that every individual in your team is a one. What I mean by that is every individual is a unique individual relationship with you as a leader. Every individual with you has a different strength of relationship with you. And the, what, the reason for one-to-one -one meetings is not just to do one-to-one -one meetings, it's to build your credibility with them, to understand their needs, build a solid, high trust, confident relationship with them. They are the success of your team. So really work on getting close to people. Their attitudes and beliefs around work have changed recently, I should think. Get close to them, understand that, recognize that, be influenced by that. I think the third practice is really around the idea that I think for a lot of us, um, there's no shortage of what we could do in a day. I think this is about helping the team to really lens in on what's really important to us. And more importantly, what's not important to us. And that when you're doing work in what's important to us, there's a very strong support mechanism in place. You know, we provide support that is appropriate to your skill level, but we're not we're not treating the fact that I just want you to be busy fools. That isn't helpful for us. We don't want mediocrity, we want excellence. So the third is a really critical one. It's one that we have to roll our sleeves up on. The, the fourth is, is again one that we think should be part of your toolkit because typically when we look at senior leaders in organizations, they're appalling at this, but also they get very little feedback. So if we're the accidental manager or leader now, if we're moving into a first level of leadership in our role, whatever our position is, this is a foundational cultural norm you can start setting up that can travel with you for the rest of your time in any organization. Because a lot of people don't give feedback because of some unproven, unvalidated fear. But if you learn to do it, you begin to realize actually it's, it's a lot less fearful and actually the benefits up, up, outweigh the the downside's hugely, and that actually it builds our relationship and that we get things done quicker, et cetera, et cetera. So the feedback culture is a really important thing to focus on. 
It helps us to navigate through the difficulties of change and understand where people are at and respond to that. Practice five, again, leaving you with a few thoughts here, is that the change journey is only as good as how well people transition through it. What I mean by that is change can happen outside me, but it doesn't necessarily mean anything changes until I personally engage with it, internalize it, and transition my own response to that change in the right way. So for example, you'll get this in the workbook afterwards, is you'll see the change model I showed earlier on. I would encourage that to become maybe the template or framework you use to guide conversations. Where are people at on that journey? How do I help you to move to the next level? How do I help to give you reassurance when you're making a point of decision about something to know that it's safe? So use a common framework and language that again supports people's ability to be able to navigate in the midst of a fairly anxious and difficult time. And then really just to leave you with the, the kind of final part, which is practice six, which is around the idea that um, we're human beings. I mean, there's nothing more clever than this, is that uh, we kind of think we're kind of robots and we can keep working to whatever. No, not at all. I think whether you're a chief exec or whether you're an individual contributor, we are human beings with certain levels of energy and reserve and capability inside us. And we need to preserve that. If you abuse that, there are, there are things called natural consequences. So if people are struggling, don't just hope it goes away. Lean into that conversation, look out for people's well-being. Uh, there's a natural consequence. If they are tired, they're not going to show up and do a good day's work. If they're not mentally stimulated, they're going to get bored. If they don't have good relationships, they're going to break down. If they don't understand what the business is about, they're not going to be as excited and as engaged as we would like. So those six practices, which you've heard me mention a few times towards the end here, those are six things I think inside your toolkit that I would encourage you to review when you get the workbook through. Have a look through them. Think about how you stack up. Ask for some skills development in whatever areas you need to fill the gap in. But have a toolkit, have something. If you don't like these six, go for your own. But develop the toolkit that gives you the confidence to navigate your team through change in a, in a very authentic but congruent way. So just to pause before we get to one final slide for myself, um, Robin, anything else that we just need to pick up with that's come up in the questions? Uh, otherwise, we, we'll close down with a couple of slides. Yeah, um, I have got one question here. Um, what if you've trusted the job will be done and then you realize it wasn't the case? How do you manage this? <laughs> Besides a few expletives, um, I would imagine the first thing is, again, you've got to check in in terms of, uh, well, firstly, did I set them up for success? I think that's an interior thing. You turn the mirror on yourself. How well did I supervise them as they journeyed through the delivery of that task? Did I delegate it and then run away? Did I delegate it and over micromanage them? Or did I delegate it without clear instruction? So I'd always say as a leader and a manager, just turn the mirror on yourself, do some reflective learning around. So what did I do? What do I think I did? What did I didn't do? The second thing is I think when you approach the person who hasn't necessarily delivered, is be careful not to necessarily judge their kind of the, the, the action, if you like, they haven't delivered and make a judgment on it without doing what we always talk about, which is to seek first to understand, then be understood. Now, there may well be influencing factors that you could learn from that they share with you before you come up with a solution. So seek first to understand. That's not pretend to listening. I'm really listening to understand in terms of what is it that caused you to not do this? Was it my brief? Was it you? Was it something else? Because I don't want to make sure this happens again. And it's only then that you'll then be influenced in terms of, so what do we then together do differently for the next time? Now, you're clearly going to have to bear in mind that, you know, if they do it repeatedly, you're going to have to make sure that if providing you've crossed the T's and dotted the I's, you're going to have to decide how many strikes before they're out. But it is about realizing that there are reasons why people do what they do. 
Is it they didn't do the detail and do it to the right level because they're just not excited in the job? Is it because I briefed them badly? Is it because they're not trained properly? So I think that suspension of judgment is a really important thing. Although it's so tempting to launch into solutions and and uh, some form of discipline involved or accountability to not doing it, but try and understand because there could well be something that's broken inside the way that the task was delivered um, to them that would cause you to learn for the next time. So not a quick answer and not an easy answer, but that would be my my kind of first reaction to that. Great. Thanks. Okay, so just just to finish off my piece, then I'll hand out I'll hand back to Robin on this. But one slide just to finish with, if I could, is uh, there's a lot of kind of thoughts and ideas I've shared on there that I think are useful to consider. I would say if you're looking to manage change and take people through something that is difficult, there's probably as a summary four things to consider. The first is don't just let it happen. Be intentional about how you manage people through that change. Don't assume they're just going to sort it out, work it out. Lean into it. Don't lean back from it. Your, your Darwinistic survival would tempt you to step back because it's fearful. It's anxious. You're not sure what's going to happen next. Lean into it. Encourage them to lean into it. So be intentional about surfacing the reality of the discomfort of change. The second is help people to cross that path of change. By giving them some guardrails, some frameworks, some structure, some order, some disciplined conversations, some cadence to the way you talk to them, and have a language in that that becomes something they get very comfortable with. You know, we, that's why the change curve has things like status quo, zone of disruption, zone of adoption, innovation. It's got a language around it that we can then use amongst ourselves when we're trying to track where people are at. I would encourage you as a leader to think of yourself as a coach not a trainer, but a coach on a consistent basis. You're, you're the best educational engine for them on a daily basis, but it's a small C coach. You're not asking to get qualified. You're just saying, I'm here to help you along the way. I'm here to reassure, provide safety, uh, nudge you, give a sense of partner, a partnership in this. So leaders as coaches is critical, I think. And the final thing I'd leave you with, which I hope I've shared with you enough is, is that momentum is so much more powerful than waiting for perfection. You're n there is no such thing as perfection anyway, but you will slow down the progress of everything if you are waiting for that. It's better to make mistakes, move forward, learn, uh, experiment, make mistakes, and iterate through feedback is the best way to go, except you don't have full information. But don't stay broken down on the side of the road because that's going to stall everything. So just wanted to say from my side, thank you for for, for uh, hanging in for the for the time we've short little session we've had here around quite a big topic um, and I hope it's given you a few few thoughts and ideas it, it will be supported in a little workbook you'll get uh, sent out to you after this um, and again I'd hope that if you do have any questions burning questions around anything we've shared go back through to Robin and, and um, be very happy to pick up with you online if there's any questions my job's not to uh, unnecessarily increase the level of noise in your life if you've got enough going on as it is so if there's any questions, do reach out, ask for help. We can do our best to support you in any way we can. So something that I think is absolutely right, if you take quotes as being anything in your life, um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, I think this one stands up really true. You can either choose to go back towards safety or forward towards growth. Uh, I think, and Maslow thinks, growth must be chosen again and again. Fear must be overcome again and again. And I don't think that ever goes away, but I think we just get better at it.